All right, guys, welcome back to part two of the Cape Biology Unit 2, Paper 2, 2017 paper. And we're continuing with numbers four to six. Number four says, light intensity and carbon dioxide concentration are two factors that can limit the rate of photosynthesis. Discuss the concept of a limiting factor in photosynthesis. So remember when you did the photosynthesis experiment with the pond weed immersed in a solution with sodium bicarbonate and the pond weed also being exposed to a light source, right? So we were investigating the rate of photosynthesis considering two factors, right? The light intensity as well as the carbon dioxide. This then tells us that the carbon dioxide and the light intensity were limiting factors, right? they control the rate of the photosynthesis process. We could say a limiting factor, therefore, is a substance that is in short supply that prevents photosynthesis from occurring at its maximum rate. And then part two says, using the knowledge of the light dependent and light independent stages of photosynthesis, explain how light intensity and carbon dioxide act as limiting factors. So using the same experiment that we did in class, again, using the pond weed immersed in sodium bicarbonate, let's start with light intensity first. So remember we put the pond weed at varying distances from the light bulb, right? So we start at probably five centimeters, then 10, then 15, then 20, and even 25. So what we noticed was that the closer the pond weed immersed in the carbon dioxide um, was to the light source, then we had a greater rate of photosynthesis. And we also noticed that as we move further away from the light source, then the rate of photosynthesis decreases. So we could conclude that at lower light intensities, light is the limiting factor because an increase in light intensity cause an increase in photosynthesis. Let's move over to the carbon dioxide side now. Similarly, if we add a sparingly amount of carbon dioxide in the beaker, then the photosynthesis rate would have decreased. Now, this is a whole six marks, so we can't stop here. We have to continue to talk about the light dependent and light independent stages. So recall, we need the light source for the light dependent reactions and the carbon dioxide for the light independent reactions. Now at higher light intensities, then we will have a photolysis of water and the liberation of electrons going into the photosystems and their electron transport chains. So we can have the production of the ATP as well as the NADPH for electron transport. In regards to the carbon dioxide, we need it for the light independent reactions, specifically the Calvin cycle. Rubisco, ribulose, one 5 biphosphate carboxylase oxygenase is waiting to accept those carbon dioxide molecules to initiate the production of sugars. So the ATP and the NADPH molecules produced in the light dependent reactions are therefore used to fuel the entire process of carbon fixation. Right, moving on to the next part of the question. Microorganisms are primarily responsible for most of the cycling of nitrogen in the biosphere. With reference to the main processes in the nitrogen cycle, outline four key roles of microorganisms in the nitrogen cycle. Hmm, 
What was the nitrogen cycle again? Well, the nitrogen cycle involves the cycling of the gaseous element nitrogen through both the biotic and the abiotic factors of the environment. The first thing you should ask yourself in answering this question is what are the organisms involved in the cycling of nitrogen in the nitrogen cycle? Well, you have nitrogen-fixing bacteria, bacteria of decay, nitrifying bacteria, and denitrifying bacteria. So the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, as the name implies, convert nitrogen, which is unavailable to us as animals as well as the plants, to nitrates. And then the bacteria of decay are involved in decomposition. They convert decaying nitrogen waste to ammonia. The nitrifying bacteria then converts ammonia to nitrates or nitrites. And the denitrifying bacteria converts nitrates to nitrogen gas. Moving on to number five, explain the mechanism by which a nerve cell membrane is able to conduct an action potential and give analysis of two factors that affect the rate of conduction. Now, students tend to overlook this topic. They study all about the action potentials, the resting potentials, the depolarization, and so on. But they don't consider the cell membrane as the major organelle that is responsible for the action potential. Now, what is an action potential again? An action potential is a sudden, fast, transitory, and propagating change of the resting membrane potential. And where does this beautiful process occur? That's right, in the cell membrane. Remember in unit one, where you looked at the phospholipid bilayer? Yes, you'll see this coming back into play with the major proteins embedded in the phospholipid bilayer playing a big function in this process. Firstly, a stimulus causes sodium channels to open. Because there are many more sodium ions on the outside, sodium ions rush into the neurons. The charge of the sodium ion again, that's right, Na2+. So the internal part of the neuron becomes more positive and therefore becomes depolarized. Now, when enough sodium ions enter the cell to depolarize the cell membrane, an action potential arises, which generates an impulse. Now, it's important for you to consider steps like the resting potential and threshold that occurs before the action potential, but that is not important here. The question specifically asks you for the action potential process. The second part of number five says, outline the general principles of hormonal action in animals and discuss the role of hormones in the regulation of blood glucose concentration. All right, so in breaking this down, we're looking at two parts. So the first part has to do with the principle of hormone action. And the second part has to do with the regulation of blood glucose concentration. And this is for seven marks. So the first thing we need to do is define what is a hormone. So a hormone is a regulatory substance produced in an organism and is transported in the tissue fluid such as blood or sap to stimulate specific cells or tissues into action. So that's one mark. Next, we need to elaborate on the principles of hormonal action. We need to talk about the effect of these chemicals or, or regulatory substances. We need to talk about the 
various sources, whether it be endocrine and exocrine, the interaction with their receptors, whether it be on the cell surface or internal, and also the type of effects that the hormones cause to their target organs. Moving on to the second part of the question now that asks us to discuss the role of hormones in the regulation of blood glucose concentration. Now recall, negative feedback mechanism is the homeostatic mechanism that is responsible for our blood glucose concentration. What was negative feedback mechanism again? Negative feedback means that whenever a change occurs in a system, the change automatically causes a corrective mechanism to start, which reverses the original change and brings the system back to normal. Now let's exemplify this using blood glucose concentration. What are the two hormones that are involved in blood glucose concentration again? Yup, that's right, insulin and glucagon. Now, glucagon is secreted from the pancreatic alpha cells in the islets of Langerhang. And insulin is also secreted from the pancreatic beta cells in the islets of Langerhans. Now, here's how these two besties control blood glucose concentration in our body. Now, if the blood glucose level is too low, the pancreas stops producing insulin and therefore produces glucagon. And the production of glucagon will signal the liver to release glucose in glycogen so your body can use it. On the other hand, if the blood glucose level is too high, the pancreas secretes insulin. Insulin moves through the body and triggers fat cells to take in blood glucose and then signals the liver to store the glucose as glycogen. Now, lastly, Vaccination is regarded as a form of active artificial immunity. Distinguish between active immunity and artificial immunity. Active immunity can either be natural or artificial. Vaccine is a suspension of weakened, killed, or fragmented microorganisms or toxin or of antibodies or lymphocytes that is administered primarily to prevent a disease. So we say someone develops active immunity after being exposed to an infection or from getting a vaccine. We also say that these antibodies are artificial because we get them through vaccination. Our body did not naturally produce them, right? Active immunity is the immunity you develop after being exposed to an infection or from getting a vaccine. Part two says, using examples, explain the role of vaccination in providing immunity to pathogens. Now, getting a vaccine is very important because it gives us immunity immunity to a disease without us getting sick. First, thinking about the coronavirus in the Caribbean. Now, you have people who did not get the disease, but they were introduced to the corona vaccine, which gave them the immunity against the coronavirus disease. And lastly, despite a decline in HIV infections in the Caribbean, the region still has a higher HIV prevalence than any other region in the world, except Sub-Saharan Africa.
discuss three factors which may account for the continued spread of HIV in the Caribbean. Now, the following are some factors that contribute to the prevalence of HIV. HIV in the Caribbean despite the interventions being done in the respective countries. We are seeing more people having unprotected anal or vaginal sex. Now, people who were already exposed to a sexually transmitted infection such as syphilis, herpes, chlamydia, gonorrhea, or bacterial vaginosis, they are at a greater risk it's because the same behaviors and circumstances that enable them to contract these diseases places them at a greater risk of contracting the human immunodeficiency virus. Now, there's also sharing of contaminated needles, syringes, or other injected equipment. And so on.